Hello, everyone. Welcome to another podcast VMR. Today, we are super excited to have two guests from Emory. We have Dr. Jason Philip Williams. He's a hospitalist, a director of focus procedure service at Atlanta Veterans Affairs Medical Center and at Emory University School of Medicine. And we have the PGI2, Dr. Nidhi Patel. She's um, an internal medicine resident. She presented a few cases for us before, and we are super excited to have her here. Uh, Dr. Williams, do you want to say hello and tell us what you like to do for fun outside of medicine? Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I like to do kickboxing. Uh, we have a little home gym here when the pandemic started and, and put a kickboxing bag in the gym. And kind of like Peloton, there's like a home app called Fight Camp where you can just stream live classes. Um, it's a lot of, it's great, great workout. Um, it's one of the, one of the many things I like to do to keep myself busy. Nice. And we have a question in the chat. How, how did you get into the focus? That's a good question. Uh, during my chief resident year, the Plum Critical Care Department at UCLA hired uh, an intensivist that was supposed to train the Plum Crit Fellows in point of care ultrasound. And I begged and pleaded, and she's very kind enough to include me in her curriculum with her Plum, Plum Crit Fellows. So I had about six months of mentorship uh, during that time and scanned a lot in the ICU and did some online learning modules. And then finally, she took me into our simulation center and I had, to, I had to pass like an OSCE style exam where she was throwing a bunch of hypotensive cases and shortness of breath cases. And I had to get the images and interpret and then use those images appropriately. Um, and after about six months, she thought I was uh, ready to fly independently, but it's it takes a lot more than six months, I think, to learn point of care ultrasound. It was probably two years before I felt really comfortable standing next to a cardiologist and showing him my images and interpretations. Um, but I was very, very lucky to have some mentorship early on. Amazing. And Nini, do you want to say hello and tell us what you like to do outside of Madison? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. See you guys in person. I've been seeing a lot of your guys' faces on the YouTube watching VMR online. Um, lately, I've been actually trying a couple of new dishes since people are having like having Christmas parties and holiday parties. So that has been nice to be able to experiment a little bit in the kitchen again, which I enjoy. But yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much for presenting the case today. Ah, we want to know what new dish you are doing. Oh, so I I made this corn dip. Um, like a, it, it was a really spicy corn dip that I made a couple of days ago. It was like a Thanksgiving slash Christmas party. And it ended up being very good. Um, I will send you guys the recipe. Thank you so much. I think, Promise, if you want to start sharing this frame, we can start with the case. OK, great. I'm actually going to give you guys, um, Dr. Williams, I'll give you a bit of extra information for the chief complaint because this patient actually came to us from another hospital. So I will start by giving you guys all of the information that we got when she first presented to us. So this is a 62 year old female. She went to an, a neighboring facility for worsening exertional dyspnea for over a month. She had orthopnea, PND, and said she had worsening lower extremity edema and a cough that was not going away. We were told that the outside physician saw her and thought her exam was consistent with volume overload. They got some imaging for her as well. They got an x-ray which showed bilateral large pleural effusions, left greater than right. Um, and they also got a CT scan of the chest, which showed the same. And she did not have a PE and she did not have pneumonia on it. She actually underwent a thoracentesis at the outside hospital. 
And the results showed that she had a transudative effusion. They did a TTE, which showed that she had an ejection fraction of 50%. And they started her on aggressive diuretics. However, her blood pressure started dropping and she became hypotensive. So then she was transferred to our facility for further management. Um, when I saw her, she said that her shortness of breath was improving and her cough was about the same. So that's the, that's kind of like chief complaint slash some of the HPI. Thank you. I'm actually a big fan of just going beyond the chief complaints. <clears throat> As a hospitalist, I'm never given just the patients here with shortness of breath. The emergency department calls, they will mention the chief complaint, but they'll start to give me information. And while they're talking to me, I'm actually looking at the patient's labs and vital sign in the computer. And so it's kind of artificial when we just give a chief complaint and have people kind of work through these things. It's not the way medicine actually works in the real world. So this feels much more realistic, this kind of narrative. Um, and it's tough getting these outside hospital transfers because a, a lot of things have potentially happened and it's not all necessarily well communicated, whether it's in the paper record or the, the verbal sign out, if there is any verbal sign out. Um, but you did a great job in summarizing here. You know, the initial one-liner, the first sentence sounds like classic congestive heart failure. Um, shortness of breath, um, sh congestive heart failure is one of the top three to five causes of shortness of breath in America, particularly in the older population, it becomes even more prevalent. And in the hospitalized population, it's it's easily, easily top three or five. Orthopnea, classically a sign of CHF that you lay flat and you have trouble breathing. Um, but interestingly, the specificity for orthopnea is only about 20%. So if patients say, I can't lay flat, I'm having trouble breathing, 80% of the time, it's actually something other than CHF. So I always have, uh, I take this complaint with like a grain of salt and think about it. Do they have OSA, um, obesity, postnasal drip, GERD, all of these things kind of contribute to orthopnea. Um, leg edema, again, kind of further raises the, the pretest probability of congestive heart failure in someone with shortness of breath, um, leg swelling. You think that maybe... Um, that's backing up from the inferior vena cava, which is backing up from the right atrium, which is all coming from the heart potentially. Um, cough, you can have a cardiac cough, um, but it's not the most common association with CHF. So, you know, think about other things in our differential. It sounds like maybe less likely pneumonia based on the CAT scan. Though I question that, I like to look at the CAT scan images myself. Um, a lot of times with these large pleural effusions, that extrinsically compresses the lung. And it's hard to sort out, is there pneumonia or is this just atelectasis on a CT? And so I like to kind of see those myself whenever possible. Um, I'm glad that when you have bilateral pleural effusions, it does make you think about CHF that does commonly cause bilateral pleural effusions. And the guidelines actually suggest just like this hospital did is you don't necessarily need a thoracentesis if your patient is behaving like classic CHF as this kind of sounds like, and you have bilateral pleural effusions, you can actually just try to diurese those. And if they decrease with diuresis over a period of about a week or so, you, you may not even need a diagnostic thoracentesis. Um, but it sounds like one was performed and uh, it sounds like it was a transudative effusion, um, which to me means it's non-inflammatory, that this is a fluid that's being pushed out maybe due to hydrostatic pressure, um, which is commonly due to congestive heart failure. Um, you can occasionally have these transitative effusions as well from other causes, um, hepatic hydrothorax, that's more likely unilateral on the right side, um, your low albumin state and your ascites can kind of track into the thoracic cavity. Um, nephrotic syndrome, it'd be interesting to maybe have an albumin to make sure the albumin is not 2.0 and there's not a lot of protein urea, maybe causing, causing some of these transitative effusions here. Um, and then it's, it's, I'm glad they did an echo because it sounds like maybe that's a new diagnosis of CHF, but it's interesting the patient became hypotensive with IV diuresis. You know, usually, you know, patients that don't tolerate diuretics well with congestive heart failure have very low ejection fractions, those EFs of 10 to 15%, um, and they have very poor cardiac output, and you diurese them and, and you further drop their preload, it drops their cardiac output and their blood pressure goes low. Um, 
So that's a little bit unusual. You know, why did they become hypotensive after diuresis? Maybe they were too aggressively diuresed. And our goal in 24 hours for congestive heart failure diuresis is about three to five liters of urine output. And if they got a little aggressive on the diuretics, if she's Lasix naive, that she may have a very large um, urine output. Um, and maybe that that's why she got hypotensive. Um, or maybe she's very preload dependent and it's a very stiff heart. Um, you can see these with infiltrative cardiomyopathies such as amyloidosis. Um, uh, you know, other things would maybe be hokum, a hypertro uh, hypertrophic, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy can be very preload dependent as well. And you, you drop that preload just a little bit and the heart is so stiff, it kind of doesn't have enough stretch to really, to really improve cardiac output. Some of those couple of things crossed my mind. Um, or maybe they just got too aggressive with their antihypertensive medications. Looking at the med list will be important. Did they titrate up um, afterload reducing agents too aggressively and, and dropped her blood pressure? Amazing. Niri, can you give us more information? Uh, okay. So she doesn't have any past medical history for her medications. She is on a SGLT2 inhibitor that they started at this hospitalization, as well as Valsartan 160. And she was on Lasix 80 milligrams that she was, she was getting um, daily. Then for her for her family history, she didn't have any history of cardiac disease, no family history of heart failure. Or, cor or coronary disease. For her social history, she doesn't currently work. She doesn't smoke. Um, she used to drink alcohol socially, but she doesn't anymore. And then she's never done any drugs. For uh, health, yeah, I guess that's also under health-related behavior. She doesn't have any allergies. I'll include review of systems on here as well. She did say that she had been feeling very fatigued for the past six months and that she had a weight loss of about 15 pounds over the last three months. And I will stop there. All right. Um, medications they started seem all very reasonable. I'm a huge fan of the um, sodium glucose transport two inhibitors. Um, really for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is what they were thinking, it really does improve um, the diuretic response in a lot of these patients. It seems to protect maybe against cardiorenal disease as well, um, and really keeps patients out of the hospital, which is the biggest outcome that's really been shown in, in the large randomized controlled trials. Um, Valzartan, um, not one of the goal-directed medical therapies that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Definitely if your EF is low, um, Valsartan um, can improve a lot of outcomes with heart failure. Usually we'll start Valsartan if the patient's hypertensive, um, which maybe she was at the outside hospital. But if she wasn't, if maybe her blood pressure was running 100 over 60 and they started Valsartan, maybe that contributed to her hypotension there. Um, and then Lasix 80 is, is um, assuming that that's IV, is, is the on the low to medium dose for a Lasix naive patient that's never been exposed to Lasix. I think it's reasonable to start at 40 or 80 IV and see how they respond. Um, they can really have big urine output the first time patients are exposed to Lasix versus your patient that's been on diuretics for many years or months. They may need much higher doses of diuretic as the kidney has adapted to that um, ion channel inhibitor by increasing further ion channels. You often need higher doses the longer you're on these medications, but it seems like a, a, a reasonable dose um, that she's potentially on. And then, you know, nothing too revealing from her family or social history, it, it sounds like here. Um, it'll be interesting to see, I think her, her physical exam um, will be really important to kind of see if she has any other signs of residual volume overload. Maybe her uh, leg edema is resolved. Maybe there's no more pulmonary edema and we just need to transition off the diuretics and, and she's actually ready to go home. Because this was an outside hospital transfer, my guess is that's probably not the case, but um, when your patients are getting hypotensive, maybe they're just dry and it's time to switch them off the diuretics. So the physical exam will be important to kind of ass assess where the volume status is here. Awesome. I can go ahead and, do, and give you the physical exam. So she was a febrile, her heart rate was 83. 
respiratory rate was 20, her blood pressure was 100 over 60, and she was saturating 92% on room air and requiring two liters of nasal cannula um, to be above 96%. And her ortho, I did orthostatic vitals on her, which were negative. For her general appearance, she was thin appearing. She wasn't in any acute distress. She was able to speak in full sentences without getting short of breath. Um, and she wasn't uh, like she wasn't gasping for air when I lowered the bed to 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 thirty degrees at zero degrees. For her lungs, she had good airflow bilaterally. She did have reduced breath sounds in the left mid to lower lung fields. And then for her cardiac exam, she had normal S1, S2. She did have two plus pitting edema up to her bilateral hips. Um, she had JVD up to her mid neck, and she was warm to touch in her distal and proximal extremities. Abdomen was soft and non tender. And I'll leave it at that before I give you some of the POCUS findings. Very good. Yeah, it does look like her blood pressure is on the lower side. I would probably just stop that Valsartan altogether. It really doesn't need that at this point. It certainly is going to contribute to worsening hypotension here. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about volume overload, and, and it looks like she's on two liters nasal cannula. So it makes me wonder whether there's still pulmonary edema or the pleural effusions are contributing to that hypoxia. So I definitely, definitely want to think about why, why is she hypoxic and thinking about imaging, whether it's POCUS or, or other imaging modalities. Um, other signs of volume overload, sounds like she still has some uh, leg edema as well. Um, and so, you know, if that's the case, oftentimes our best volume status exam is really the leg exam tends to be the most accurate. Like if you can push down on the leg and it leaves a big dent, that's pretty deep. You've got a lot of fluid there. And, patient, and, and many providers will um, guide their volume status management, mostly based on the leg exam. Um, unfortunately, auscultating for crackles, the sensitivity for pulmonary edema, if you're listening for crackles, can be as low as 15, 1-5%. So even though we don't hear crackles here on exam, um, ultrasound is much higher sensitivity for detecting pulmonary edema. Um, and this kind of decreased breath sounds um, in the lower lung fields, um, particularly on the left side, you wonder if that is residual pleural effusion. Maybe they did the thoracentesis on the right side and the left side still has a large volume. Um, and then I think about what is the intravascular volume status of these patients? So um, I think the way to approach volume status is in different compartments. It's, I don't think it's fair to use a broad brush stroke to say this patient's volume up, this patient's volume down. Patients store fluid in different parts of their body, and we should rate each one of those separately, and that'll then help us conceptualize how to manage those compartments. So let's say, for instance, maybe she's got a pleural effusion and some leg edema, but if we look at her inferior vena cava, if it's totally empty, she's got low central venous pressure. And this blood pressure of 100 over 60, I'm worried not only is her central venous pressure low, but maybe her effective arterial volume is low. And if you have low intravascular volume, um, try to diurese that patient. When you give someone diuretics, um, that is coming from their effective arterial volume. And so if you pee out three liters in a day, you just lost three liters of blood. And if you can't refill from the legs or the lungs, and it's not getting intravascularly, those patients get hypotensive. That classically happens with your nephrotic syndrome patients. They're really hard to diurese sometimes. Uh, blood pressure gets low because they have such low oncotic pressure. It really doesn't keep fluid intravascularly. And you see all this pitting edema all over their body. You just can't get it intravascular. The rate of refill can't keep up with the diuresis a lot of the time. Um, yeah, otherwise, there's no... Um, no uh, clear other clues here that I can sort out. It's nice the patient's warm and well perfused. You always want to make sure they're not in um, cardiogenic shock, make sure that they're mentating okay, um, which it seems like the patient is at this point. In terms of point of care ultrasound, I think lung is the best in terms of um, point of care ultrasound because our physical exam and chest x-ray just misses stuff. You'll see a bunch of white stuff on chest x-ray and it's hard to tell is that in the lung? Is that a pleural fusion outside the lung? Um, but ultrasound can really sort that out. 
Um, I definitely want to see the inferior vena cava, but I think about the lung compartment is, is that, are the lungs still wet? Are there bee lines, signs of fluid in the lung? Is there a pleural fusion outside the lung? Um, and then finally, I think the cardiac point of care ultrasound is really helpful for any patient that's hypotensive. Maybe the ejection fraction has dropped since the last time. We actually know ejection fraction is very dynamic. Normally, um, prior to POCUS, we were getting echoes once every three months, six months, or a year. Um, but when you do cardiac ultrasound more frequently with POCUS, it's free and just takes a few minutes, we can see very dynamic changes in ejection fraction. Even in the course of one hospitalization, a patient can come in with an EF of 50%. And classically, this happens with severe sepsis in the ICU, but that severe sepsis will drive down their ejection fraction to 30 or 20% sometimes before finally recovering over, over time. And so maybe there's been a dynamic change there. And also just thinking about um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and amyloidosis. Um, and, you know, when I think about the left ventricle and the ejection fraction, maybe she's got a hyperdynamic ejection fraction. The EF has actually gone up to 65 or 70 or 80%, which we don't see that often, except if you have very low preload in the left ventricle. If you have these ejection fractions that are off the chart and it looks like the chamber is completely obliterated, that's usually a thirsty left ventricle that intravascularly, that left ventricle needs more preload in order to maintain the cardiac output and, and blood pressure. So there's a couple of things I'm, I'm looking forward to. We probably shouldn't forget DVT and PE as well in our differential, um, especially if that IVC is empty. This doesn't suggest the leg edema may be coming from the right atrium, and we should look at the other pipes like the femoral veins and popliteal veins, make sure there's no clot there, should maybe look at the heart, make sure there's no right heart dysfunction now. Maybe she developed a DVT and PE and now has um, uh, some severe right heart dysfunction. Um, and then finally, if she's got pleural effusions, make sure we haven't developed any pericardial effusions causing tamponade. Um, so those are a couple of things I'm looking, looking forward to on our POCUS exam. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Williams. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, promise. Deborah, can you see the screen? Okay. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so I'll just start off with this image before I show the lung exam. Um, when they taught us how to do lung ultrasound, this was the blue protocol, uh, which which our curriculum taught us. But usually you start off over here in the upper uh, areas of the chest. And the first thing that you you can do as part of the protocol is look for lung sliding. Um, and basically you can rule out a pneumothorax. So I did that for this patient and she didn't have one. And then these are the four, four different areas where you can look for specific things on the on the um, ultrasound. So for example, for this patient, we might be looking for B lines, which could give us a hint that she might be volume overloaded on exam. So I'll start off with those before we go to different sections. So this was her the ultrasound for her lungs. It's not the best picture here, but so I put another picture next to it of what it looked like. If you wanna comment on B lines, Dr. Williams. Sure, sure. So where that orange uh, cursor was just a second ago, um, you have that bright white line as the, the plural line. Um, I don't know if I can, I probably can't share my pointer, can I? Um, oh yeah, thank you. You guys, you guys got one. But yeah, that bright white line at the top, that's the lung pleura. Um, and then coming down from that are these kind of vertical spotlights um, that are kind of moving back and forth. They kind of get wider as you get to the bottom. Um, and you see them kind of a little more clear on the image on the right, all those vertical spotlights coming down. And that happens when you have some type of infiltrate in the lung itself. Normally, air is the enemy of ultrasound. And so when your ultrasound waves go into the lung, they're lost forever. 85% of those ultrasound waves just bounce around and never come back to the probe. But once you start putting something in the, in the interstitium of the lung between the alveoli and you thicken that interstitium, then you can conduct these sound waves, these vertical um, spotlights into the lung, and you actually see those reflections come back to you. The differential for B-lines is, is broad though. Often in the hospitalized patient population, it's CHF or pneumonia about 85% of the time, just because that's our most common 
um, causes of shortness of breath in the hospital. But we should keep in mind, other things can cause thickening of the interstitium. Anything that causes a pneumonitis, so if you have an acute lung injury or ARDS, those are those severely hypoxic patients in the ICU, um, as well as fibrosis, that can also thicken the interstitium of the lung. And so the interstitial lung diseases, these autoimmune pneumonitis and, and fibrotic changes of the lung can also cause B lungs. Um, but so far, this lung ultrasound is consistent with a CHF diagnosis, but I always keep those other things in the back of my mind as we continue to evaluate the patient. Okay, great. And then this was just what it looked like in those four different quadrants. Great. I think it's good to think about not just one spot on the lungs, but we want to get a geographic distribution of where are these beelines? Is it just one area? Is it bilateral? Is it symmetric? Is it worse in the lower lobes in the gravity dependent areas? So for, for CHF classically, the pattern should be bilateral. And as you get down to the lower lobes closer to the diaphragm or posteriorly, the number of beelines should increase because that's where fluid is pooling with gravity. And that's increasing the amount of edema and that increases the number of beelines we see. Versus if you just have unilateral or one side, I would think about some of those other processes like pneumonia, acute lung injury, pneumonitis, those, those type of things as well. Awesome. And then I have this picture here that we got. Dr. Williams, do you want to kind of orient them? Yeah, I think the arrows are pointing at the plural line, that bright white line. Right. And then above that is like a little sliver of black that there's probably a small plural effusion that we may be looking at above that. It's a little bit hard without a, a video, um, but my guess is maybe that's a small plural effusion that someone picked up there. Correct, yeah. So this, I think it's called the sinusoidal sign. Um, Dr. Is that right, Dr. Williams, where you can kind of see a square above the plural line? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that term. Okay. Maybe, maybe you could educate us. Okay. Um, well, I can go on to this. This is, let me see if I can get the video on here. Okay, it won't let me play this video, but this is, un so after you look at the lungs in those four areas on the anterior chest, there's um, something called the plaques view, where you look at the posterior mid-axillary mid line, and you're able to use your focus um, to actually look over, you could look at the liver, and then you can look for fluid that's that's surrounding the liver and it can tell you information about pleural effusions as well. And you can yeah, see this that. Is a, this is a great place to look. I think a lot of people, if you're if you're really busy or your patient's critically ill in the ICU and you can't move them, that oftentimes they're just looking at the anterior chest, but so much stuff hides in the lateral and posterior lobes. I think it's really important if, if you're looking around to kind of check out these areas. Um, and like you were highlighting, maybe you can point to the liver for everyone again to kind of orient right. everyone right here. here. Good. And then, um, you and then above, I'm getting new wedged in. Please, I'll just connect my phone. Sorry, we got got a few people. I'm getting in. in. Um, above that to the left is black or anechoic space. And that looks like a pleural effusion. Now, I know that's a pleural effusion because down at the bottom of the screen, I see a bright white line that's kind of lumpy. And we call that the spine sign. So normally, if we're ultrasounding the lung, we actually can't see the spine in normal healthy patients because air is the enemy of ultrasound. And so none of our ultrasound waves ever reach the spine. But if you're seeing that bright white spine at, above your diaphragm, that tells me you must be conducting sound waves through fluid um, to get down there and bounce them back. And then slightly above the spine, you see probably some adole atelectasis um, of the lung slightly consolidated um, just a little bit higher than that. I um, see kind of a crescentic shape gray structure. That's the consolidated lung that's being squished um, from the pleural effusion. A couple of things I like to look at if it was a video, um, you know, this was called a transitative process, but I'm also looking for loculations or fibrin stranding, which is very classic with pneumonia and cancer, those exudative pleural effusions. Um, and then 
you know, sometimes we look for proteinaceous content, which kind of, some people call the plankton sign. You see kind of swirling echogenic debris kind of floating around. That usually means you have an exudative process that's dumping a lot of protein and cells into the pleural space. So those are other things to kind of think about in trying to uh, classify your pleural effusions. And then this was the IVC. Um, so here, so you can see that the IVC is here. It was 2.2 centimeters. And I don't think this video is played either. But when we asked the patient to take a sniff in, it didn't collapse. Great. Great. And so those are the two numbers that we like to gather for the inferior vena cava. The American Society of Echocardiography guidelines ask us just to lump central venous pressure into one of three categories, either high, medium, or low. And in this case, um, you use the maximum size, um, which here is 2.2 centimeters. Normal is 2.1. So this is actually kind of borderline. This is pretty close to normal, but technically this is dilated just by 0.1 uh, centimeters here. Um, and then the second thing we think about is how much um, blood comes out of the IVC into the right atrium with each breath. And so that's the collapsibility with respiration. Um, and if, you're, I, if you have normal central venous pressure, you see great respiratory variation or great collapse with inspiration. But in this case, it sounded like there was no collapse, which suggests that the right atrial pressures are quite high and blood can't exit the IVC into the right atrium because of high central venous pressure. So both of those numbers are suggesting um, potentially high central venous pressure, which sounds like it does correlate with your um, neck vein exam, which you thought was kind of a little bit elevated too. Correct. Okay, awesome. So now I'm gonna show you some images from the cardiac exam from, yep. And so this is the parasternal long axis view. This is your probe marker over here and it's, it's pointing to the patient's right side. And I'll play it first. So just to orient you all, over here, this is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. This is the outflow tract, the aortic outflow tract. This is the aortic valve. And then over here is the right ventricle. And I'll let Dr. Williams comment on what he sees here. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we look at is that mitral valve movement. And you'd like to see it come up and get pretty close to the septum. And in this case, it does look like it's hitting the septum. And when that happens, that means um, you have very good cardiac output. You probably don't have reduced ejection fraction. The idea being that if you uh, the heart contracts during systole and ejects a lot of blood, then during diastole, you got to empty a ton of blood out of that left atrium to refill the left ventricle. And that's going to push that mitral valve way up to the septum. Um, versus someone that's got very low cardiac output, that door doesn't need to open very much because not much, much blood is flowing in. And so this is probably normal ejection fraction. And I confirm that by looking at the left side of the ventricle. And I want to see that septum and inferior wall pull together. And that diameter should shrink by about a third. And in this case, it does. So I think this patient's got, got good left ventricular ejection fraction as the echo previously confirmed. Um, the other thing I ask myself is how is the right heart doing? And so you don't get a great view of the right heart. Um, Nidia, if you could kind of circle it there at the top, that black anechoic structure, perfect. And so I kind of look at the um, north-south diameter and kind of compare that to the size of the aorta and the size of the left atria. And you can almost draw a line on the right side of the screen. And along the right side of the screen, it should be one third right ventricle, one third aorta, one third left atria. And if you have a dilated right ventricle, that, right, that little black sliver is gonna be much taller um, and take up more space on the screen, but it really looks normal, normal size. The rule of thirds seem to apply here. So I don't think there's any severe right ventricular dysfunction. And then finally, um, the last thing we should always ask ourselves is, is there any pericardial effusion present? Sometimes we kind of just stop at ejection fraction and just kind of move on. Um, so if I look at the top of the screen, it's not obvious there's any pericardial effusion above the right ventricle there, but towards the bottom, my, my eye is, uh, is drawn to yeah, that, that anechoic black space there with the white pericardium just below it. Um, and one thing we should think about is like, is this a pleural effusion? Because we know the patient had a pleural effusion. Maybe we're just looking at fluid in the thoracic cavity in the lung and not in the pericardium. 
But if you highlight the descending aorta at the bottom of the screen on the right there, it's a kind of a black circle. Yep, you're circling it right there. This, this fluid is going above that descending aorta. And that means that it is a pericardial effusion, not a pleural effusion in this case. Um, versus if the fluid goes deep and down the, down the screen, um, it may be a pleural effusion if it goes deeper than the descending aorta. But in this case, it does look like the patient has a, a pericardial effusion. Um, so I would you know, think about you know, diuresing a patient with a pericardial effusion. You know, are we potentially putting them into a tamponade physiology, um, which can happen? And I see a lot of great comments too um, on the on the chat here. And patients are wondering about left ventricular hypertrophy or um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think those are those are great things to think about too. Um, we see the septum does look pretty thick um, there, and the inferior wall is also relatively thickened too. Um, and so, if you had a really good um, image and and you could slow it down and actually look at systole when you can see the left ventricular contract. And if you're worried about Hokum, you can actually see the dynamic L left ventricular outflow tract obstruction during systole as it kind of runs into the mitral valve there. Um, I don't know if these images are quite quite good enough to, to say that, but um, something something to think about is, is there is this just regular left ventricular hypertrophy or is there something more something infiltrative in there like amyloid or maybe a, a hokum type of pattern is very reasonable to add to our differential too. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Williams. And then this is the four chamber view of the heart, kind of looking up at the heart, like your probe is a flashlight. And so I can orient you guys. So this is the left atrium. This is your left ventricle, your right atrium, and your right ventricle over here, and then the septum. Yeah, so when I'm in this view, if I'm thinking about tamponade, I'm kind of training my eye on the right side of the heart. The right atrium is a great place to start. Um, and so I'm looking at that free wall, the right atrium at the bottom. You can see fluid just um, inferior to that on the image. And it's a little, this is hard to time. So ideally you actually have an EKG on here, or what I do is I'll actually slow it down and look at that free wall of the right atria to see, does it collapse when the tricuspid valve is closed? So in, in other words, it's normal for the right atrial wall to collapse when the right atria is contracting. When it's contracting, your tricuspid valve is open. But if you see that right wall collapse while the tricuspid valve is closed, that means the pericardial effusion is crushing your right atrium, um, and that's a sign of early tamponade. Um, and similarly, we'll look at the free wall of the right ventricle and see if there's any any um, collapse over there, um, which is it's not obvious to me in these images that that it is. Um, but the sensitivity for us looking at tamponade is pretty low, so I haven't certainly haven't ruled it out here. Oh, sorry. Thank you, guys. So that what those were the POCUS images that I have. So, Dr. Williams, what are you thinking now, based on some of the based on the POCUS exam that we did? And there wasn't any right ventricular collapse um, when I was looking at it. Yeah, I think you know similar similar things as we kind of talked about on our differential. Um, earlier is, you know, let's maybe get a formal echo, make sure there is no tamponade. And the best way to do it is you can actually, you can get fancy and put Doppler across the mitral tricuspid valve, and you can actually see pulses paradoxus as you breathe in, um, that blood flow velocity changes as the right heart fills with fluid that crushes the left heart. And during inspiration, um, blood flow across the mitral valve or the left side of the heart will drop. And then during inspiration, it increases. And so I, I love looking at that. Um, but this effusion is not huge. So I think we should also think about um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And those patients are hard to diurese because as that left ventricle gets smaller, as you drop the preload, the septum starts to encroach into the left ventricular outflow tract. And you can't pump blood out because the septum is literally kind of in the way um, during systole. Um, and so those are those are some things I'm thinking about here. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm gonna give you a some of some basic lab work now. 
So her sodium was, I'll start with the BMP promise. So the sodium was 135, potassium 4.4, chloride of 99, BUN 21, creatinine of 0 0.95. Um, the albumin was normal. For the CBC, white blood cell count 9.8, hemoglobin of 10.1, and platelets of 300. She had a BNP, which was 1,017, and we didn't have a baseline for her. And a troponin, initial troponin of 50, which trended up to 62, and then trended down to 58. I'll also put in a urine analysis in here which was normal without any proteinuria. And then I'll go ahead and share the screen so I can show you the EKG, if that's okay, promise. Thank you. Okay, and so this was her EKG, Dr. Williams. Okay, looks like Sinus rhythm, got a bunch of P waves before the QRS is here. And that troponin that you mentioned, was that a uh, standard troponin or high sensitivity? It treatment? was a high sensitivity. High okay. sensitivity. I'm, I'm less familiar with that scale, but is that on the lower end of the high sensitivity? It's, on, it's on the lower end. Yeah, okay. it's not normal, but it's on the lower end. Correct. It's helpful. So always think about some ischemic changes on, on EKG, but there's no obvious ST elevations anywhere or even significant ST depressions. Um, let's see, or maybe some Q waves in lead three and AVF. Maybe she's had some uh, past ischemic events. Um, and kind of lower voltage in, in V5 and V6, uh, as well as some of the limb leads, which you wonder if that pericardial fusion is contributing to some of that. Um, yeah, otherwise, nothing's really jumping out of me with this EKG. Yeah, that was, that was exactly the same thing. There wasn't really anything jumping out. And then we just did notice that she had some lower voltage, um, especially in leads one, two, and three. Okay, great. So I will tell you all the imaging that she had. So we repeated a chest X-ray and CTP while she was at our hospital. So that X-ray showed the repeated bilateral pleural effusions, the left side greater than the right side. We didn't have a previous X-ray to compare it to. Um, and she did have a CTPE as well, which just redemonstrated the pleural effusions, did not show any pneumonia, and again was negative for PE. Then we did a, T, a, a formal echocardiogram, which showed that her ejection fraction was 50%. The read was that her left ventricle was smaller than normal with severely increased wall thickness and septal thickening. The right ventricle was normal size with low normal systolic function. There was a moderate circumferential pericardial effusion present that we had noted um, on POCUS and large bilateral pleural effusions. No signs of tamponade on the echo. No signs of tamponade on the echo, correct. And so I'll pause there and kind of open it up to you all on what you would do next for this patient. You open it up to me or to the entire group. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder here. There's a lot, lot of good, lot of good comments. I guess in, there's like good things yeah. in the chat. Um, but if you want to add anything that's not in the chat, you broad said infiltrative process, and the read said plural tap and cytology. Noah said consult cardiology. Awesome. Yeah, and I hear someone actually put on the cardiac MRI, and so I think that's pretty reasonable. There's. If you're thinking about some infiltrative process that's maybe causing a dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, um, cardiac MRI can sometimes see those. Um, there's also some fancy nuclear medicine studies that can look at the heart um, if you're worried about an infiltrative process or, or hokum in there. Um, and then finally, if you're really going down that road, some people will even do like an endomyocardial biopsy, like go in intravascularly into the right heart and actually take some tissue from the heart if you're really worried about something going on in the muscle itself. Um, potentially there. Um, 
could also see inflammation on the heart. Maybe this is like a myocarditis process um, that would be picked up on the PET or the MRI too. Um, I think those are all, all very reasonable. Awesome. Um, so sometimes heart sometimes heart. you can even do dynamic stress testing in these patients and actually do a stress echo and you can actually see the dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction if that's what you're worried about causing that hypotension is you do the echo and then you stress the heart. And what those extra catecholamines, you can see that septum come in to the left ventricular outflow tract. And so that's a potential, potential option as well. Great. And I saw some people said that they wanted to investigate the anemia. Um, the labs did show iron deficiency anemia with a low ferritin. And I see people talking about bio fat pad biopsy. Um, so before that, so we actually got SPEP and UFPEP, which were both negative, but we got immunofixation along with those, which was positive for a IgG kappa paraprotein, which was concerning for myeloma. And it was interesting that her creatinine was normal. There's a lot of times in patients that you're suspecting amyloidosis, um, their creatinine will actually be higher. And then the light chain ratio that we got was also elevated at 283. We found that the patient had, a, we found out we got some more records from the outside hospital and she had had a PYP scan done there, which was negative. And I'll kind of leave it open to you, Dr. Williams, for discussion before I go ahead and reveal the final aliqua and diagnosis. Yeah, great. What, what was that scan? I wasn't familiar with that, that PYP. Is like a nuclear medicine study? It's a nuclear medicine study, um, and it's used to diagnose ATTR amyloid, and oh. it's able to see if there's amyloid fibrils within the heart. And that's all I know about it. If anyone has any additional information, feel free to jump in. That's great. I'm glad you brought up ATTR amyloid. I think it's like trans, you guys can tell me what it stands for. It's like transrethrin, but it's one of the most common causes of cardiac amyloid. Um, you generally don't pick up a positive SPEP, UPEP, or immunofixation with this. I think this ATTR cardiac amyloid is mostly just cardiac related, though you can have a little bit of peripheral neuropathy, like carpal tunnel syndrome, tingling in the fingers, um, and things like that. So the fact that you've kind of picked up um something on the immunofixation with this like light chain ratio, this tells me it is probably a, a B cell process. That is um, when your light chains, you have two different light chains and normally your body makes about an even amount of them. But if one of those clones starts to take off and replicate on its own, it's gonna make a ton of its own light chain and your ratio goes way out of control, which suggests to me that there's probably a B cell population that's growing out of control and pumping out um, if not full antibodies, then parts of the antibodies itself that are kind of deranged. Um, so I'm glad, glad you guys sent that. Um, ultimately, if you're worried about a B cell population like this and multiple myeloma, I think the next, the next step is usually a bone marrow biopsy. It's often where these clones live and you can make the definitive diagnosis that way. Awesome. I like fat so, pad biopsy too. I think that's, that was, that, that's a fun suggestion. I've never seen it, but that's, that is one of the test options. Yeah, so the next step was actually to get a fat pad biopsy to look for um, light chain AL amyloidosis. And I actually have the images from the biopsy so you guys can see. It was my first time seeing them as well. Um, but, you know, it's the, the classic buzzwords that we hear on step exam, the Congo red and the apple green birefringence. So in this one, um, this was this was a fad pet biopsy that that they had done, and you can see that this was the under the Congo red stain, and then this was the apple green birefringence that you could see on the biopsy, which confirmed the diagnose the diagnosis, which was AL amyloidosis. Um, and then we also did get a bone marrow biopsy, which was suggested of multiple myeloma. Excellent job. And then um, I I guess I, I just want to like bring up a teaching point because so unfortunately this patient, what, what happened in real life is that we ended up transferring her to the hemonc service where she actually started chemotherapy 
for um, the myeloma and the amyloid. And she was doing well. This was actually around Thanksgiving and she wanted to go home right before the holidays. So she went home for the holidays and she was supposed to return to outpatient clinic to continue getting chemotherapy. But unfortunately, after a couple of days, she was readmitted into the hospital for weakness. And during that hospital course, she ended up having um, a stroke as well as a DVT and a PE. And she required intubation actually because of the stroke. Now she is extubated and doing better. But just one teaching point is that these patients with amyloid, they're at increased risk of coagulopathies. So it's very likely that the PE and the stroke that she had was related to the amyloid. And they have a very low threshold of starting these patients on anticoagulation, which is maybe something that we could have considered um, prior to discharging this patient. And one thing that I learned was that the CHADS, the CHADS 2 VAS score that we do in patients with AFib actually does not um, apply in these patients. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, like she did have a short course of AFib through through her hospitalization stay, but it, it, it was just there for maybe about a minute and then it went away. And so she wasn't started on anticoagulation at that time. So a lot of learning. Um, but yeah, hopefully she gets the treatment and starts feeling a little bit better. It's been kind of a rough hospital course for her. Well, you, got her you got her on the right track though. Great job. Amazing. Thank you so much, Niri, for presenting this case. It was absolutely fascinating. And Dr. Williams, do you have any reflections about the case? Yeah, I think, you know, in the beginning, if you have trouble diuresing somebody that has a good ejection fraction, quote unquote, of 50%, um, and they're intravascularly volume overloaded, as we saw with that dilated IVC, they've got leg edema, they've got that pulmonary edema, they should be able to refill that three to five liters of urine output and maintain their blood pressure. Um, but someone um, like this, you're having trouble diuresing, you should think about maybe a very, very stiff left ventricle. In these patients, their Frank Starling curve is not like your, your eyes. Their, their curve is pushed way to the right, and they need way higher preload to distend that left ventricle and, and, and maximize their stroke volume and cardiac output. And, and if you have patients with normal, quote unquote, EFs or left ventricular hypertrophy, they're getting hypotensive with diuresis, can be a clue, as, as it was in this case, of an infiltrative cardiomyopathy causing a really stiff left ventricle, severe, severe diastolic dysfunction, as in this case. Amazing. Thank you so much for all the discussion and everything that you teach us. We learned it a lot. I think we can go for some teaching points with Tansu. Thank you so much, Nidhi, for this very educational case. So we started, and thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for the amazing discussion. Uh, we started with a 62-year-old female patient presenting with uh, worsening exertional shortness of breath, orthopnea, PND, and uh, leg edema. Uh, so congestive heart failure is among the top three to five causes of shortness of breath in U.S. hospitalized patients. And specificity of orthopnea is actually very low at 25%. And in 80% 80, 80 of the cases, uh, the uh, orthopnea is secondary to other causes. Uh, leg edema increases the pretest probability of congestive heart failure uh, coupled with the shortness of breath. But leg edema may be coming from other processes such as DVT, PE, uh, RV dysfunction, and tamponade. So it's good to keep in mind these other differential diagnoses. Um, cough uh, can be secondary to a cardiac cause, but it's not the most common cause of cough. And, and pneumonia is actually more common, but given the patient's uh, chest CT being normal, pneumonia is less likely. Um, bilateral pleural effusions are common with congestive heart failure, but diagnostic thoracentesis is not always necessary. We can just diurese those patients and watch their uh, clinical improvement. Um, trans transitive effusions uh, point us toward a non-inflammatory cause, uh, which shows us that the, uh, the effusions are secondary to a hydrostatic pressure increase. Uh, when the trans transudative effusion is unilateral, we can think about hepatic hydrothorax. If it's bilateral, we can think about nephrotic syndrome. And in that case, we check albumin. 
And why did our patient have a hypotension after the, uh, the diuresis? Uh, pa some patients who are uh, naive to diuretics may not tolerate the diuretics well. And uh, those patients uh, usually have low ejection fraction at baseline. And uh, if they are diuresing too aggressively with diuretics, especially in diuretic na naive patients, that could also lead to hypotension. And then we should also think about infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Uh, in such cases, uh, those patients are preload dependent, and uh, when they, they are diuresed too aggressively, they can have hypotension. We should also check the medication list of the patients. Um, Lasix, it's reasonable, reasonable to start with uh, 40, 80 milligrams, and as kidney adapts with increasing ion channel inhibitors, we can up the dose in patients who are not naive to diuretics. And we can assess the volume status uh, with physical exam to decide to go on with diuretics or not. In hypoxic patients, uh, there can be many causes for uh, hypoxia, uh, such as congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, or pleural effusions. And in those cases, POCUS is really, really helpful uh, to illuminate the cause of the hypoxia. And best volume status exam is actually leg exam. Uh, if the patient has pitting edema, that, that shows that the patient has lots of fluid. Um, and pulmonary edema uh, assessment, uh, auscultation for crackles have low sensitivity at 15%. So uh, checking the lungs with ultrasound is better than auscultating the lungs in such cases. Um, when we assess the intravascular volume status, we should think that uh, there are different compartments and rate those different compartments separately, which helps us with management and prevents di overdiuresis and uh, prevents hypotension as well. Um, and we looked at uh, the four quadrants on the lung focus next. Uh, the four quadrants are used to assess uh, different pathologies in the lungs, such as pneumothorax, if we see a non-sliding pleura, or B lines, um, which, uh, which infiltrate, uh, which shows that there are infiltrates in the lung, uh, or thickening of the interstitium of the lung, which has many differential diagnoses, and B lines. And in B lines, we look at whether they're symmetric or they're focused in one area. And in congestive heart failure, B lines are bilateral and usually focused on the lower lobes because are, the fluid is gravity dependent. In, if the bi B lines are unilateral, then we should think about uh, more uh, localized processes such as pneumonia, ac acute lung injury. And we should also not forget to check the lateral and posterior lobes because fluid might be hiding in those areas. Um, and next, we looked at the inferior ve vena cava. Uh, and the normal maximum diameter of IVC should be less than 2.1 centimeter and should collapse more than 50%. If it's not collapsing, then we can, uh, we can think that the right ventricle pressure and the central venous pressure is high. That's why it's not collapsing. And mitral valve movement also provides us a clue about the cardiac output. If mitral valve is hitting the septum, that shows that there's good cardiac output and normal ejection fraction. Now we talked about the rule of thirds, the right ventricle, aorta, and uh, left atrium should each take, take up one third of the screen. That's the normal uh, appearance. And uh, then we visualize pericardial effusion in the images that Nidhi shared with us that made us think of tamponade. Um, right atrial free wall uh, does, uh, so we should check the right uh, atrial free wall does collapse when the tricuspid valve is closed because it collapses when the TV uh, is open, but if it collapses when TV is closed, that shows us that there's pericardial effusion that's crushing the right atrium, which is a sign of early tamponade. And in this case, uh, Dr. Williams asked for a uh, formal echo, uh, echo and Doppler possibly of the mitral and tricuspid valves. Um, and Nidhi gave us the EKG of the patient, which showed low voltage in V1, V2, and V3. Um, and echo showed no sign of tamponade. And uh, we were worried about an in infiltrative process in this case. And we talked about cardiac MRI and endomyocardial biopsy or nuclear studies being useful to uh, 
eliminate the infiltrative processes of the heart. And then we saw the stress echocardiogram. Uh, we also talked about stress echocardiogram as a modality that could be used to assess uh, the dynamic LVOT obstruction. Um, and Nidhi shared us uh, the increased light chain and immunofixation test results of this patient, which made us worry about the B-cell process and where do these uh, B-cell processes hide. To uh, find out, we needed to do bone marrow biopsy, and it showed us that the patient had uh, multiple myeloma, and the fat pad biopsy uh, for AL amyloidosis showed us the apple green birefringence. Um, that we see in the Congo red staining. And then we, uh, we learned that there were two processes contributing to the patient's clinical picture, uh, multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis uh, as a result of that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tansu. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for the discussion. And thank you, Nidhi, for this amazing case. I hope to see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.